Ding Dong Ding Dong Ding Dong Willkommen zu I'd like to cordially welcome all of you to the Documenta Habitat in Hackney and I'm very pleased that over the next couple of days we are going to have a platform for the Catholic Youth Symposium and we will deal with the question of what it means and how it is to be a human being. And we would like to look at this question from this specific angle, the angle of what can man be when connected with the world. We have about 5,000 people from all over the world that have joined our digital format. It was a very special format. I mean, organizing a symposium with 15 young people here in the Documenta Hall. Everybody sitting here and waiting for the YouTube channel to be opened. So, no matter where you are, out there joining us on YouTube or here in the Documenta Hall, be welcome. I like to start my presentation right now, my lecture right now. And in the course of my lecture, I am going to introduce the speakers you are going to meet. And I'm also going to highlight the conditions, the framework, the events we have included in our youth symposium. And our topic this morning is understanding born in the resonant space of embodiment. Castle, by the way, is a exciting place to be. On this photograph, you can see on the one hand uh, the Documenta Hall, and to the left of the Documenta Hall, you see the right wing of the Opera House. And the tree you see here without leaves is wonderfully green right now. And here at the State Theatre, we have uh, experienced a change of uh, director. Thomas Brockerman is leaving and Florian Lutz starts when the theater opens. And he starts as a director who has to somehow deal with all the open issues due to the COVID pandemic. And his stage manager, Sebastian Hanak, thought next time, next season, I'm going to open the wings and the backstage to build in a kind of special theater. You will have little boxes next to uh, one another so you, you can see it separately. You can bring in groups, attend an opera and still observe the hygiene concept. And the whole traditional setting will look like an amphitheater. That is to say, uh, such theaters will be combined in the state theater for the next theater season. And in the middle of all these uh, boxes, uh, all these amphitheater stage, you will have the orchestra, you will have the singers, and we are looking forward to how this space will turn into a new form. And we will see what happens, how all these people, 360 degrees surrounding the stage, and sort of being involved, being right in the middle when on stage the spirits of theaters will rise. The spirits of the theater are the demons. We will have Pan, and we will call this whole new stage and theater setting Pandemonium, and uh, we will all be there to see how the spirits of theater occupy the stage. And uh, we are anticipating arts happening and uh, being present in the world and the world being present in the theater. And this is what we would like to focus on today. We are always in resonance with uh, what happens in the world and uh, how can our resonance spaces of embodiment right, mm, enforce our understanding. 
this once again shows the Documenta Hall. And I'm now going to talk about the Documenta Hall, the place we're in right now. At the moment, it is networked on a worldwide scale, starting from San Francisco, ending up in Beijing, and we see our institutions are networked, are linked with similar institutions all over the world. As soon as we leave the Documenta Hall, after this symposium, the Documenta Hall, for some period, will become a, a place for rehearsals. But then, next year, we are going to have a major art exhibition. It's an exhibition that takes place every five years here in Kassel. And uh, since I'm a citizen of Kassel myself, I can say it's a global exhibition, a, an exhibition of global importance. And, and an artist collective from Indonesia is going to come here. It is a, a team, a collective that was born in the year 2000 in uh, Documenta, and this uh, artist collective is called Ruang Grupa. Ruang Grupa means in Indonesian space and form. And as I said, pandemonium turns a space into form. And here again, we are going to deal with the question how a space will can become a form, or to say it in other words, how can form, capture space. So it's about a mutual process, space being form, form occupying space. And for the next season of Documenta, the managing director wrote the theater with a pandemonium. Andrew and Grupa, this art collective that are soon going to come to Documenta Hall. They come here because they have a very similar attitude vis-a-vis -vis the arts. And let me add in due modesty that our symposium is of a similar nature. We would like to embark on a dialogue to see how can space turn into form? How can form occupy the space, embrace the space? I have so far highlighted two places when I said castle is an exciting place to be. Now I'm going to introduce two people from castle. In Kassel, we have a somewhat elderly lady, Ines de Florio Hansen. For a long time, she was a professor for foreign language research. Mr. Florio Hansen was born in 1943, and she was factually blind when she was born. At least she was severely visually impaired. She was born in Wies. Baden into a family with French and Italian roots. She had a happy childhood, and she had a classmate who taught her how to swing her hips like Elvis Presley. At that time, it was important to be able to dance like Elvis Presley. And if you can't see how he dances, you have to sort of resonate with the music. You have to train your hips with an assistant. When she was 48 years old, she had uh, surgery, and step by step, she started seeing, she learned to see. And I'm going to tell you what she went through, how seeing made her experience space as form. I'm going to talk about that, and Mr. Florio Johansson, you are here with us in person today. Welcome to you. And. We had an interview with you before I started my presentation, and Mr. Florio Hansen gave her answers and, uh, in German and in English, and uh, she also wrote a book in German and English on her experience, how it feels when you learn to see. And I talked to Ms. F Florio Hansen and uh, could hear from her how it feels to learn to see. So this is the first person, the first personality here in Kassel I'd like to introduce today. And on the other hand, I also would like to introduce Kilian Singer. Kilian Singer is a professor for experimental physics. He is with us only online, digitally, so to say. And Kilian Singer is a great programmer. 
and I'm going to talk about his programming efforts uh, some somewhat later. Who you see here is his collaborator, Sam Dawkins. He works in something that will be very important for the next generation of uh, video conferencing. In Kassel, we have research underway where we are preparing the next generation of video conferencing. And this re research very soon is going to uh, take a concrete form. A startup company will be formed. And I'm going to talk about uh, how to learn and see when I talk about Flor Ms. Floria Hansen and how we apply our faculty of uh, our visual faculties. This is what I'm going to talk about when I talk about Kilian Singer. Now, this is all I wanted to tell you about Castle. Castle being a place, an exciting place to be. Now I'd like to really start my lecture, which is called Understanding Born in the Resonant Space of Embodiment. And the question that will guide me through my lecture is, how does meaningful understanding arise from the resonant space of embodiment? And here you would note there are many ideas included in this uh, question. Like, for instance, when I am bodied, I do have a gate to be in resonance with the world. It also means that when I confront myself with the world, with an understanding of whether it is a link with the world, whether I do have a link of the, with the world or not, is very important. What I want to find uh, lines for cognition going hand in hand with uh, the resonant space of embodiment. And this brings me right in the middle of education. How can experience, cognition, understanding be united so that I do not alienate from the world but embark on a constant everlasting dialogue with the world? And I'm also going to talk about the new insights uh, that we have been able to get during this special time of the corona pandemic. Now, Ms. De Florio Hansen, in her book, she talks about her surgical intervention. All of a sudden, she had eyes that could see. And all of a sudden, she was there in a waiting room and could see chairs. And she didn't know what they mean. They, they, she knew there's something there. But what is this object? What are these objects in the waiting room? And she describes how she started out by touching the chair. As soon as she touched it and moved it a bit and moved her hands along the edges of the chair, she experienced the chair. She had an experience that sort of linked her visual faculty with the chair. In the beginning, she could not immediately understand what her eyes saw. She had to touch things. She had to touch the objects to understand what they are. And in a telephone conversation, she said to me, I had to rehearse two hours a day in order to be able to see and grasp those chairs in the waiting room. And it took a long time for her to say, well, this is this chair, and it stands here and there. I have read her book relying on my experience in philosophy. And that is why I started asking questions to Mr. De Florio Hansen. I asked her, when were you sure that this object or this chair is there for sure? For a philosopher, it means the intentionality of seeing. How can I see things and recognize the, object, the objects for what they are? And she said to me, well, you never learn it completely. You never stop learning. You never arrive at a state where you can say, this object is there, and this is the state of the object. She told me on the phone, she, 
She has a 12, 50 meter long corridor from her working room to the uh, door of her flat. And if she has to rush to the door because there's a parcel arriving, she closes the doors and she just walks along the corridor without trying to see. And she said when she arrived here, she could rely on her faculty of hearing. She knows exactly what she's doing when she closes her eyes. For her, the spaces form is an audio experience. And the cognition, the understanding that people learn when they are children, that you always walk towards a chair, for instance, and when you were there, this chair got bigger. You could touch the chair. It was smooth. And it has something to do with your faculty of seeing and the area of space you could see. Then, as a child, you started struggling for the chair with your uh, friends. You moved the chair, you rocked the chair, the other person you played with also rocked, tried to rock the chair. So you had a dispute about the chair. Your field of vision changed, and all these different experiences made you feel sure this is this object and it's there. When you were nine months old, you could point at objects and, and others would understand what you mean because they could see as well. Your world, as you see, was a world, the same world for others who could see. Now, when you look at something, you have a wealth of experience. And Miss Floria Hansen had to learn it at a very late stage. For you, it's OK. It resonates. You know immediately, I'm five meters away from this object. This is object uh, ABC. It's a long story of encounters. And this object that you see, this is the moment where you can say, OK, I am here. I have my experience, and I know over there there is something. You can immediately say, this is what we have. And this what we this is what we call bodied experience. You have your experience of moving around in the world. The changes of your field of vision all merge into one understanding. This one understanding means this thing is there. The intentionality of seeing, or in philosophical worlds, the intentional capture of the world is not possible without a whole world of experiences that we combine. And there is uh, in audit cognition, embodied cognition. There is research going on. And I, as a person, I am in the middle of it all. It is not just a logically negotiated cognition. It is a, a cognition where we wake up and understand we are in the middle of the world. We understand it. We experience it. We learn. And the things I just talked about, Florian, Ms. Ms. Florian Hansen, can be summarized by saying that our immediate physical, bodily experience can bring together so many things, can turn space into, into form. This is a never-ending story of experience. This is uh, a story of encounter that we use for the present. And it's called memory. I just call it uh, experience in the past. We have an experience in the past that is transformed into the immediate bodily presence. When we position ourselves in the world, as I have explained, Mr. Floria Hansen also said in another conversation I had with her, that she cannot see and recognize faces very well. In my case, she will know, oh, well, there is a person with a receding hairline. She nods. 
uh, obviously uh, my d image of myself and her image coincide. So she sees me standing here, here, a person with a receding hairline speaking like Soma speaks. For her, language is something that she uses to learn something about people. And then you have the pointed nose, the beautiful mouth, or the receding hairline, whatever features, visual features, she combines with that language. And this uh, motive that the visual experience is important, we are going to hear about that as another aspect when Thomas Fuchs gives his lecture. Thomas Fuchs will focus on an anthropological perspective and also talk about seeing. And he is going to speak from the angle of what does that mean for the human being. And he says the physical space where I can say there's an object there and others can say the same. This is always a space that is a space not for me alone, but for others. And this is the interpersonal dimension. The world for me, the space for me, is also a space for others. And my physical space that I am present in is also a space that others are present in. That also means that the space for me, which is a space for others, always resonates in my experience. The fact that I am in that room makes me resonates uh, with the others. I always have experienced this. And this is very interesting to note. I'm not alone here. I am here. And that creates a resonation with the others in the same space. And this becomes very clear when I see facial expressions. And all of a sudden, the body, the facial expression becomes infused with feelings, human feelings. I mean, I don't see my own face. I am, but I do not see myself. I cannot easily uh, take that perspective. As far as my face is concerned, I'm in a position that I'm very much exposed only when others look at me. I look at their faces and I learn something about myself. And as a student all over the world, you know, there are teachers, lecturers that can look at you and you don't feel all right. You feel uneasy. And there are other lecturers and teachers that give you space. They look at you and you feel free. And there are other teachers uh, that want to survive and they know a hard glance uh, is helping them to survive. A glance is an immediate expression. And this expression is very authentic because I do not have a perspective on myself, an external perspective on myself. I do not see myself. Seeing and being seen is always a matter of the interpersonal space. And now, I would like to move on to Thomas Fuchs. Tomorrow he's going to give his presentation. And he's going to talk about the bodily and interpersonal space and uh, will focus on the aspects that I've just highlighted. And he's going to provide these aspects with a very thorough anthropological perspective. Now. Thomas uh, Fuchs is going to speak tomorrow. But then let me also talk about Ruan Grupa, the uh, artist collective that is going to be present in Documenta. When we ask how can space can become form, we would say to the artists of Ruan Grupa, our direct physical immediate presence makes space a form every second of the time. In our physical presence, the others are present as well. I always feel the interpersonal perspective, our physical presence as it turns space into form has something, has a very connective element. How can we, we be as human beings on the earth? And uh, 
Ruan Krupa says it's like a barn, a rice barn that is shared by many people and provides the nutritional basis for all of us on earth to feed ourselves and exist. That was our first step towards anthropology. And now we'd like to start with individual facets of anthropology. When I exist physically, immediately, it always means that I always experience myself as the center of the universe. But when I start touching myself, I also notice I am a bodily object or subject. Uh, for English, it's a bit more difficult because they don't have not two words. The body I am, this is the immediacy that I would say uh, in English. And if I see myself as an object, then I talk in English about having a body. In German, we have two different words. I am a Leib, which is a subject body when I am. A subject body or Leib means my immediacy, my immediate presence, and body is the physical person. When I'm a small child crawling through the world, notice several things in my world. Then a chair is something that is difficult to move, and I feel this heavy character of the chair. But I also feel that a chair is an object. And here we feel that we are bodies and have bodies. And then being a body means it's, you have immediacy. and. Uh, Having a body means you have an external perspective. As a baby, when I notice there's something hard when I push at it, I experience the hardness, hardness as if it were in my inner self. At that moment, uh, moment, I feel I have a body that is hard. And since I am in the middle of, of it all, I move around, that means I am a body. Being a body means I can be immediately present in a world of objects. Being a human being also means being a body that always gives you the experience of, experien the, of experiencing the world, the world of objects and also the hardness of objects. Thomas Fuchs is going to talk about that in more detail. And I leave out uh, Mr. Fuchs's presentation for now, and I'm going to change perspective for once again, and I'm going to talk about education. I'm now going to focus on a lecture of Walter Brinkmann. He teaches in Berlin. I have a few quotations here, and as you will notice, uh, Mr. Brinkmann that I'm going to quote is a person that has a very good education, both in educational sciences and in philosophy. If I, as a small child, as an infant, press against the wall or remove the blanket of my bed with my foot, I notice the properties of the blanket in my own body. I notice uh, the uh, physical properties of the objects. That is to say, my own body tells me about the corporeality of uh, the world. Being a baby means I start experiencing the universality through particular experiences. Malte Brinkmann says, embodiments means we refer to ourselves. We are, we form judgments. We link the special with the general, the particular with the universal. There's something special that is in embedded, embedded in universality. Right from the start of our existence, we form judgments. And these judgments are not just logical links. It's a general process of finding, and it's about this process, general process of finding. Malte Brinkmann 
says right from the start we are embodied we always experience the other and we notice how we are we are embodied self-reference and only in that way we can fully understand the world logic is not just something that can be negotiated in operations. It also has a physical, embodied presence. Malte Brinkmann also says, uh, forming judgments can be practiced and trained, and we practice and train from birth onwards. That is to say, when we talk about education, we have this inner movement of uh, forming judgments, and we train, we practice these judgments. In the beginning, our judgments are physical, are bodily. And then when we go to school, we uh, start experiencing other educational processes, and more and more our judgments become abstract. But all our judgments are rooted in bodily judgments. And this is interesting, and whenever talk about this self-referentiality, I'm going to talk about an inner movement, because that inner movement uh, makes me learn about being different. And this experience of what it is to be different uh, determines my varied positions within the world and towards the world. And the large perspective we are going to get is that we can use our abstract judgments and stay closely linked to our experience when we look at our inner movements that is embedded in our bodily judgments. We always have this inner movement. Ever since we have been children, we have been going on through these internal movements. This movement step by step gets transformed and can be translated into more complex cognitions, understandings. All of that has a basis that uh, is present throughout our whole life, and this is the perspective, this is the presence I'd like to look at. What it just said can also be reworded according to Hartmut Rosa, the sociologist. Uh, I just gave you a few examples, and uh, given that these examples, Hartmut Rosa says we are always mutual, ref mutually referential. That is to say, we are both world and person. Why? Because the world is experienced inside us, and what we experience there can be understood by us in, a, in uh, as objects. We have a mutual referentiality all the time. That is to say, we can say step by step, I am here, the objects are there. Because the things that are out there, they are things for others as well. They do not only have to do with me, they are also available and disposable for others. A joined experience with others makes the world a place full of objects. Uh, that is why we have language naming objects. One could have a whole philosophical series of seminars on that. Hartmut Rosa says, because of this mutual referentiality, we can see ourselves, understand ourselves as subjects and objects. We could always say, I only understand myself as a, as a body. I feel okay in my body and all the rest, I don't care. But then it does not mean that I would be in connection. If I talk about the body I am, and the body I have. 
subject and object are sort of separated. And I understand that there is a separation of the body I have and the body I am. Having related to Hartmut Rosa, I would like to talk about schools for some time. We have uh, organized this symposium at a time where we celebrate the 100th anniversary of education at Waldorf schools. And now I like to talk about how the model of uh, block education gets uh, block lessons, gets new input f coming from the research. What can, how can we use anthropology to learn something new? At Waldorf schools, you have uh, block lessons for two, three, four weeks, and there is a well-established tradition. And there's a bit of exercise of uh, advertising for the block lessons. Here you have immediate experience uh, when you start learning about a new chapter uh, of your lesson. You have a first-hand experience and you learn about what it means. This means a change of perspective. And uh, the key element is the students' changing of perspectives. What we have in Waldorf schools, uh, it's uh, this uh, kind of uh, strong experience as a personal looking at things from a personal perspective, and then you change the perspective. And this change of perspective is the key element uh, embracing all lessons of this block lesson. And you have to choose your examples well to work with that. And uh, they, these examples were well chosen. They fit into a philosophical frame, and we can say what they mean. What I mean now, what can be added now, is that you look at the processes of judgment that are inevitably linked with a change of perspective. All these judgments must have a physical, a bodily basis. Judgments, forming judgments uh, can be or must be embedded in the resonance space of uh, embodiment. And my hope is that we will learn in a better way in the near future, that we will use these re resonance spaces of embodiment as uh, giving us opportunity to form judgment. That can be brought together with the examples that uh, we choose. And I'm telling you why I consider this to be particularly interesting. At the moment, when I open the newspapers and read about ecological, environmental issues, all the discussions about climate change, we have to develop personal habits that are linked with the own dynamics of nature. This is a very academic way of saying we have to develop habits uh, that fit our reality, our environment. That is to say, our personal habits have to be rooted, have to be linked in the dynamic of nature. That means abstract, difficult, challenging judgments must be combined with our inner movement when we learn ever since we were born that embodiment is the basis of judgments. My hope is that our physical presence will create the resonance space for our judgments. How is this possible? My thesis is we have an inner movement that uh, we exercise, that we train ever since we are born. It opens a resonance space, and that resonance space puts us in a position to 
form abstract judgments. Nobody w wants to get just ab abstract rules. Our own solution is that we do things that we want to do. And we can do it because we have this bodily basis, this bodily foundation that always resonance, uh, resonates. And that means when we understand that I am in the world and I have a world, that will open us new perspectives. So this is my hope. And I hope very much that the Waldorf schools can give relevant answers for our urgent uh, societal issues. They will not be in a position, these Waldorf schools, to uh, provide us with a panacea, but they can make a contribution by opening this perspective of uh, the bodily foundation. Now I'm going to tell you how you can arrive at the same idea from a different angle, from a different perspective. I just wanted to show this slide uh, once, uh, once more in order to show that uh, judgments are embedded in the resonance space of our embodiment. Now I'm going to talk about Siri Hustvedt. This afternoon she is going to uh, give her first lecture on how it is and what does it mean to be a human being, conditio humana. I'm going to introduce her in more detail this afternoon, uh, talking about uh, all the activities she has been involved in. Siri Hustvedt says, when I leave, uh, read literature, I give myself up to the reader. I'm not just saying I'm reading, no. I give myself up to the author. I dive into this inner space, into that relation with the author. And there, something special, something particular opens up universality. And she also says, if you read, be open to a new relationship with yourself. That is to say, open your resonance space of experience. Let it resonate while you venture into a new direction. And Siri Hustweg underlines that good literature always means that there is a particular that points towards universality. So it's it means I am rewritten when I read about the world. This is also a very interesting aspect. I also would like to say for our academics out there that follow us online, in a university context, we would uh, use phenomenology, that is to say, something can unfold so that you can develop a theory, a theory of ideas on the basis of a dialogue. It's not about reductionist approaches. It's about learning in the context, contextual studies in phenomenology, as you can uh, see here. And that's also about an individual single example has many aspects of reality overall and how this can be opened up to universality. How to make the implicit explicit is what you would say in English. Uh, I just wanted to mention this, and now what I would like to do with you now is to look at a development 
where I'm always amazed that it has taken place in Kassel. And it has something to do with the educational approach that I have just uh, mentioned. Let me say very clearly, I'm not going to introduce a, a class as you would have it in school. I'm going to introduce a new technical development, but I try to do it in a kind of dialogue format, in a dialogue process. I try to unfold this new technological development to create a link to our personal experience. So it's not about the content of a class in school. Here, we will enter a room. It's a kind of corridor. It could be anywhere in an office or in a doctor's surgery. On the left-hand side, you have uh, high mirrors. And I can go through that corridor, but I can also look at this space to my right. I can see what is happening on the right hand side when I look to the left and see the mirrors. And I let two protagonists uh, walk into that space. Uh, Sam and Kilian will be the names of those two persons, since they are the researchers. And they would uh, go into that corridor. They could uh, look to the left. They see what happens elsewhere, because um, they see the reflection. And Sam and Kilian can say, OK, those two chairs on the right-hand side have two opposite chairs on the left-hand side. They can uh, say, well, we are in a big space where four people consider, could sit on these chairs. And we will use only the uh, part of the room where you have those chairs. Now Sam and Kilian would sit on the chairs. They can look at each other when looking. But of course, I could always uh, scratch the mirror or put a curtain in front of the mirror. Then the two of them could no longer see each other. And when I uh, enter that space, that room, uh, could I still see f uh, two Kilians and two Sams when I enter? And this is still the case. Although the mirror no longer reflects, I, if I enter as a third person, I will see four persons sitting there. I see those four chairs, and I don't mind seeing them. It's not a problem. It's about this space. Now, I take it out of context. And I say, what I see here as a reflection, is that real or not? That brings me to a fundamental question. We have this situation here, and we have to discuss, is this optical space that the two people see, is it real or not? If Sam and Kilian talk about what's happening, they are always going to talk about the same thing. They will have joint attention. They will notice the chairs that I see on the left-hand side are the same chairs that they see. So they can say it's a physical and interpersonal space, and the things that they see are part of that room or space. I just talked about Thomas Fuchs, who says that the bodily space is an interpersonal space where I can negotiate and talk about what's happening. And so it's the same thing. Let me leave Thomas Fuchs, and I'm going to speak myself again without quoting. I would say I am dealing here with shared experience, with uh, joint experience. It was not just uh, conveying of information. I just showed how joint attention makes me understand. I would uh, tell teachers if I were training them, they would have to see their students and discover them so that their, wills, uh, their own world becomes a world for others as well. I would then say, could the lights in that optical room uh, blind my eyes? What would happen if I go through this narrow corridor and touch objects? 
Now, we s move on. We move into that space, and we have Kilian here. You can see Kilian here and Sam, and they sit on these chairs. Now, Sam and Kilian should always look into their own eyes. And to make it easy, I just have put Sam on the chair. Sam sits on the chair, can have eye contact with himself. When Sam looks into his own eyes, I just need a very small area here of this uh, optical space so that Sam can see his own eyes. And in the same way, I can do the same with Kilian. Kilian also needs just a very small section of the mirror to look into his own eyes. That is to say, all the rest could be uh, colored in a different color, and I wouldn't have to care about this optical space anymore. It's just those small sections that matter. Everything that is smooth, every surface, smooth surface of the world can create optical spaces, in particular, computer screens that you can touch as well. That is to say, I could put two touch screens on the wall. They would be wonderful mirrors where both Sam and Kilian can look into their own eyes. Now, I take Sam again. And Sam has a small camera next to him. This camera could film Sam as he looks into his own eyes. The camera that is positioned where you have the name Sam would focus right where you see this arrow. This arrow here would be the position where the camera films Sam looking into his own eyes. Now you might say this reflected mirror is used to film this, and this is projected onto Kilian, and then Kilian would look into somebody's eyes, and that's cool. That is to say, if you want in a new Zoom conference to have people opposite you that look into your eyes, we will have to position the camera next to yourself. Next to you, there will be a small camera. Your screen will be used as uh, the uh, optical space that your co eye contact with yourself will be filmed and will be projected to your interlocutor sitting at another screen, he would see you having eye contact with him or her. Well, uh, since time is nearly up, let me show the slides to illustrate how this process looks like. Again, we see these projections uh, the moment I film, and then the wall is no longer relevant. I just need those two reflecting mirrors from an anthropological perspective, there's something happening there, and Thomas Fuchs is going to speak about that. Um, the, probably you would arrive there, you would bring in all your earlier experience, you would use your experience to understand the room you're in. And the moment I project the eyes, that would be the f I would leave out the first immediate experience, and I would have arrived at an objectivizing perspective. Uh, I can handle that technically. Here, I need to move on. Kilian and Sam are good programmers, as I said before. And what they do is, uh, when Sam is being filmed, he is moved into the digital space, that is to say his uh, photograph will be somewhat be more refined, will be projected onto the screen. And Kilian, who has had visual faculty ever since childhood, would see something now on his screen. And Sam uh, will see the same behind this wall. That is to say, Sam and Kilian could sit there. I could film Kilian as well. And in the back, you would have Sam getting Kilian's image, and in front, there would be Kilian getting Sam's projected image. 
And those two persons would look into each other's eyes and would see themselves clearly behind the screen. So I do not have to look at the screen uh, anymore. I can look beyond the mirror into the optical space where I can see another person. Then the touch screen can be configure, configured so that you can share and uh, share the screen, split the screen, you move the parts of the screen around. And that gives you a situation where everybody can point at a shared screen. Uh, I can send those images uh, around the world uh, for Sam to Australia, for Kilian to the United States. And those two people could talk to each other as if they were sitting in the very, very same optical room on these chairs next to each other. Now, let me show you how that looks like in a film. I'm very grateful to Kilian Singer for having made this film available to me. And now, you are going to see Sam, and you're going to see Kilian only uh, from the back. Hi, Sam. Hi, Kilian. Unfortunately, we do have a problem. We have too much noise because of the amplifier. Let's do it like that. What can we do? You have to use a, a transistor. Here, exactly. We need this device and it would work. Let's go back uh, and I'll make it a bit louder. You had a first ex impression. Sam is being filmed. His screen films him and Kilian sees him behind the screen as if he was there in, were there in person and Kilian will understand and, and will see what is uh, what Sam is looking at when looking at his screen same scene again So there we are, next generation of video conferencing. And I really would like to praise Sam and Kilian, and I'd like to explain what they're doing as human beings. You can look at peers behind the screen, and you can have eye contact, and you will notice if they click on something on their screen. And you can also move the windows on the screen. What do they do with such capacities? Here you look into an optical space. Your vision is taken into an optical space and uh, showing and moving is done on a plane. That is to say you create a human ac um, space for action that is spatial and uh, you see when things are being looked at and being moved uh, on their respective planes. When I look into the space, I, it's about the person. And when I move and show things, it's about objects. This is how this technology is being made. But it's a totally different way of uh, vision compared to what F Ms. Florio De, Han De Hansen learned to see. Mr. Florio Hansen had to learn to see step by step and understand and see that the world for her is a world for others as well. Kiliam and Sam just used the fact that right from the start they had uh, very identical visual experiences. They can look into the mirror, they can communicate, and they use all these natural faculties in order to develop new technology. Uh, as I said, it's a the history of experience. Those people have uh, 
found an understanding of what is happening in the uh, optical space, and they align, they're looking into the optical space, and they have a brilliant idea, na namely getting it embedded into a digital environment. That brings me to our video conferencing habits uh, these days when we have COVID-19. This example shows that we have always relied and pro on our experience, have profited from the experience we had together with others, and then we could negotiate uh, with our peers uh, what we are talking about. And those next uh, generation of video conferencing will give the best opportunity to find a common ground, to find a common understanding. If you have people with the same previous experience, it gets much more difficult if you do not have the same experience, common experience in the here and now, in the ego perspective change of perspective and uh, you change perspective, you align your perspective in the optical space and then you have this uh, wonderful, brilliant idea how to uh, develop things further. Now, if I realign that to our bodied existence, it's always a process of being in the world. And we hope very much that after Corona, after COVID-19, hopefully we will have a lot of time for experience of being in the world. And then understanding that being in the world for me means uh, being in the world with others too. And uh, the world for me in our experience also has the resonance. It is a world for others as well. And uh, here I can look at the ideas that are present in the world, the opportunities that are out there for me in the world. And that also means that our immediate physical presence means we can enter into a dynamism. I did it with you. I walked along this optical space in our bodily dynamics. We understand it's not just for me, it's also there for others. The world, as I see it, is existing for others in the same way. And that brings opportunities for dynamic development. And last, yesterday I learned a wonderful new word for the sculptures in the Fredericianum, the exhibition that you can now see. It gives us the opportunity to see everything from all angles. We are physically present, we are there with others, and uh, we can see the world from all its angles. And here, let me quote Christian von Busse. It uh, shows me there is joint attention and in this joint attention, my own identity limits me, but I can find new things when I align myself with others. When I embrace this bodily dynamic, I have this immediate experience. It's a world for others. And here together, we can all be in the world. So it's also an education against fake news. When I see the world for me is a world for others as well. It's also a kind of response when we are very focused on identities that limit us. We can widen it. We cannot go beyond our narrow identity and share experience with others, align ourselves with others. This is uh, an answer to the question, how can understanding be born in the resonant space of embodiment? I've shown you how the physical dynamic is substantial for us. It's a process that begins the moment we are born. It, it's a process where we have a dialogue with the world all the time. Our experience is an experience of the world and it's an individual experience at the same time. It's a world we experience, a world that we have, and this bodily dynamics uh, 
is used in our resonance space of embodiment shows us that we are very much interwoven with the world. And here, my great hope is, as an educator is that we will develop a habit of judging, a judging always on the basis of our intricate link with the world. What I have explained as a process of, of uh, aligning perspectives gives us an opportunity to stay in sync, to stay linked with the world. And at the end, let me come back to Hartmut Rosa. Let me say in the upper secondary classes in senior high school, where you focus very much on cognition for the students, you have this kind of resonance space of embodiment. And their melody, their resonance uh, creates the opportunity for new condition. From the very first second of my life, I learn to judge as embodied cognition. And this uh, resonance, this fundamental resonance or resonance space of embodiment accompanies us throughout the melody of life, the melody of the world, the melody of cognition. This is important to me, and this is the statement I would like to use at the end of my uh, lecture. Thank you for your attention. And now you have an opportunity to ask questions. And I'd like to just look around and ask you who would like to ask a question. And if you want to ask a question, please join us here up front and use a mic so that everybody can see and hear you. And of course, you can remove your mask and please tell us your name and where you come from. Paula Cole, I'm from Tübingen. And I would like to ask whether the seeing that we experience as non-blind people, the dominance, of our visual perception is one of the reasons that people tend to prejudge or judge much too quickly. My impression, our optical sense, our vision is a very dominant one. And if I characterize the way we look into the world, the sense I see, since I see the objects in the world, is a carrier of a recognition. I do see the world in an intentional way. And this is particularly true for our vision. It's an epistemological sense of perception. And since we have passed the time of enlightenment and know how to sing the song of rationality, there is a lot of imminence, presence, and recognition in our vision while seeing we recognize that is, and this becomes becomes the habit, the way we live our modern life, which has us be biased quickly, and we tend to judge quickly. Now, in order to answer your question, 
Our vision is based on recognition we are children of the Enlightenment, which means that in the movement, which is part of our vision, is a movement that goes along with designation, which can succeed or fail. I might remind you of Florio Des Hansen, who says, you need to listen. You cannot only see how people walk, you only also hear it. Noel is my name. I'm from Göttingen. In the Waldorf School, they say every morning, I look into the world. Now, if you carry the world in yourself, wouldn't it be equally important to look at oneself? And would I find the world I see outside in myself? Because I carry the world also when I'm blind. I do perceive the world nevertheless. Since many people listen out there, I look into the world and then you write a picture of nature where the sun shines. That's what happened in Waldo schools every morning. But I limit myself to the phrase, I look into the world. Now let me answer your question. I would like to kind of be the advocate of Siri Hustwood, or I steal her ideas. She will talk to you this afternoon. She will smile in a very charming way, and she will assume that you are there and she is here. But she will also imply that this is a very courageous assumption. Because this is going to be an experience based on experiences we have had so far. And I'm a subject, and I do experience the world. So let me try and explain, because I would like to have you see that we are connected or entangled or intertwined. That's what the English say, the world and us. So we are in a mutual conditioned situation, which is based on the assumption that there is a common ground that helps me, helps me find myself. Now, the exciting bit is how do I decide, how can I decide? In the encounter with the other, I encounter myself. And I can decide and say the other is only the other, and I am I. I quoted Prosa when I opened the brackets and his statement about the subject and the object, and that both arise from each other. But then we are also free, and I can believe something else, and I can go and say, no, my point of departure is my experience, and my experience is characterized by mutual relations. And I, in myself, can contain the world as a whole. I can be the world in myself because I engage with the world, which means I can orient my thinking in a dialogical way. I can go and have a dialogue in my thinking with the world, or I can decide or choose to be passive. There are lots of mathematical statements in physics, and this is due to the fact that many questions can be left open initially. But my opinion, and that's Wilfried Sommer speaking, I believe 
that we can also attribute an essential position in this process of recognition. That's what I do. I'm carry out. I'm carrying out scientific work. I'm a scholar because I'm convinced that I can get something contentful, meaningful by engaging with the world. And if I rely on this world in adequate figures, I get even more recognition. I gain recognition. Or I might also quote Brinkmann and say that the inner movement is, in my judgment, and it and may be coherent with my recognition so that something comes out of it which connects me with the world in a sustainable way. I don't know whether we can gain any sustainable recognition without an essential claim. I decided for myself to have this essential claim, claim in order to gain sustainable recognition. Further questions? Ismaya from Saprakan. You said that a face offers the truth. And of course, in video conferences, we are called upon to control our face, our mimics. So what about this particular suffering in our faces, our emotion? I would like to come back to a conversation I had with Joost Sharon, a colleague of mine, a few days ago. He's listening to you. He is also in the undergraduate college of the world of pedagogics. He's offering these seminars, so I'm using his ideas now in my answer, and that's what I would like you to know. So we talked about seeing each other. And of course, this is, first of all, a direct approach. It's direct seeing, which is a situation we experience as long as we don't see our faces in a mirror. As soon as I see my face in a mirror, I can use a mirror in order to use a poker face when lying, for example. So as soon as you get the mirror, you get the external perception, which has an influence on my action. And I can also train certain mimics, certain faces. And of course, I train also my unhindered face. Now, what about video conferences? So in my Zoom window on my screen, I see myself, and this window tells me all the time, Mr. Dama, this is the way you look like. And also arranging my face so that others don't see what they are not supposed to see. So I'm always having the third person perspective. Now, being an adult means you learn how to see yourself from the outside and you can integrate your feelings, so to speak. So this is part of growing up. And you all know, more or less, what impact, what effect you trigger and what the third person perspective on you is. I.e., the video conference has you become a bit more aware of what it means to be an adult or of reflecting yourself. Now, I've seen myself time and again in video conferences, and when I see myself all the time, I miss what makes my life exciting normally, i.e. all of a sudden, 
in a presence, I experience lots of different things. I can experience the tone changes, but this is very subtle, and it's not there in a video conference because there I know the way I am and the effect I have on others. So that's why hardly ever people get angry in video conference. I haven't experienced anyone getting angry in a video conference in the last six months, in spite of the fact that it might have happened. I simply never experience it. The self-reflection is a means of control, so to speak. You control yourself, but then you also lack this element of self forgetting and Sharon said learning self forgetfulness is a gift and I do agree it is a true gift if I can experience myself in a course I teach for example and due to the corona experience we have to relearn that we are allowed to forget ourselves in embarking on relationships with others and I'm talking about empathy any other questions Eric Felger, I'm from Überlingen. I participated in a conference a while ago, and there we talked about our presence. Now you just talked about self-reflection and control. This is also about being present. I'm a speaker, and I listen to myself. And at the same time, the listeners can continue my sentences. That's what a dialogue is about. That's interaction. Now, I wonder, is it possible to have this dialogical experience in this space? Can you trigger it? I mean, can the presence of the speaker and of the listener be part of the virtual encounter in a digital space. Does it happen? In my answer, I would like to briefly refer to another conversation, a dialogue I had with Beth Weisburn. She's on the east coast of the USA, and whole classes are listening, listening now, and teachers too. Now, in one of our conversations in preparing the youth symposium, she mentioned the space of thought, i.e., a space that comes to mind in a Zoom conference when all of a sudden you realize you are in the same space of thought. Now, I had a number of Zoom meetings in English, and at least once a day, I felt that I was in a space of thought, in spite of the fact that I felt like an alien, nevertheless. So there is something we cannot really are completely captured right now. And now I would like to come back to Kilian Singer and some Dworkin's intervention, and I would like to characterize their invention in an anthropological way, and this is not meant to be criticism. I would like to decline in an anthropological way. What about the anthropological way of approach here? And they say I can lift my head and I see a person two meters in front of me, a person who looks at me, and a person who, and, and I can use my finger when another person is one meter away from me and I argue, which means I extend 
my body in an intermediate bodiness. That's what Thomas Fox is going to talk about tomorrow. I can reach the body of the other so that my seeing is being conditioned in a distance of two meters and my movement in a distance of one meter. So I am a bodily being in a body which hits a wall at a distance of one meter and sees someone in a distance of two meters. So that's what limits what binds my experience horizon considerably. In other words, I do not really see everything I do or trigger. I mean, you tend to look at your cat and you see how he or she moves and then you know more about summer, but that's not the whole story. I think we are much better. I think the invention is an excellent one, i.e. I am collaborating with someone based on a lot of knowledge I have already. And I realized when we're talking to someone else that whenever he or she is with me, he or she looks at me. Whereas when he or she is not with me, he or she puts his or her finger on the paper. So there are two different ways of being or perceiving. It's like seeing and showing, and that's the limited experience. But I think we get a much better experience when going about if the other one is shown to me in a half permeable way and I can forget myself, I have more interaction. But then I'd rather go and see Killian. More questions? Now I look at my watch and I'd like to say that there is time for one more question. But there is no more question. We don't have to have a question. So I would like to say goodbye and thank you to all our listeners out there. I will move out of the picture in a minute. And then we need a moment. And then Stefan Ziegler will be here for the people who are present here at the Documenta Hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>